In the first part of our axle story, Matt explained how the drive gear and pinion setting is determined at the factory. Now it's time to see how all this ties in with noise diagnosis and gear adjustment on the car. Bill wants to learn more about axles, so he'll give Matt a hand. Okay, Matt, we're ready to get into the servicing part of axle noise and gear adjustment. But first, for everyone's information, I'd like to cover some general facts about axles and axle noises, which can make diagnosis easier. Axles normally make sounds which are typical of gear operation, so don't jump to the conclusion that all axle noises mean trouble. Normal gear sounds may be disturbing, but experience has shown that the cause of this kind of noise seldom results in a breakdown. For example, if the sound is light, more like a tone than a noise, and only comes in at certain speeds, it's probably a normal periodic vibration which sounds off through the drivetrain, but is otherwise harmless. Now, in many cases, you can reduce or eliminate abnormal gear noise by adjustment even on cars with considerable mileage. Of course, where gear loads have been extra heavy, chances for improvement by adjustment are less. But it's worth a try before you decide on a new gear set. In other words, you're saying that the gear tooth contact pattern should be checked and followed by an adjustment if possible, instead of simply condemning the gears or telling the customer to put on more mileage with the hope that the noise will go away. Right. And when you have to install a new gear set, Again, be sure that the tooth contact pattern is correct, or you may get gear noise all over again. Any questions, Bill? No, but I'd sure like to get some pointers from Matt on axle noise diagnosis. A road test is the best way to diagnose axle noise jobs before and after you've worked on them. Try to get the customer to ride along and identify the noise so you can aim your diagnosis in the right direction. When road testing, Remember that axle noise is usually loudest when the lube is warmed up, so run the test for a reasonable distance. Also, be sure to shut off all accessories so you won't mistake blower sounds for gear noises. When you know what the noise sounds like, you'll then have to decide whether it's an axle sound or something else. Other similar sounding noises can come from tires, wheel or axle bearings, the transmission, or the engine. Wow, with all those possibilities, how do you sort them out? Well, some noises are hard to track down, but when you know the characteristics of the possible sound sources, you can usually tell which is which by simple tests. For example, tire noise is a continuous sound that varies with car speed. This noise is easy to identify because it changes as the tires pass onto different road surfaces. In comparison, gear noise usually fades out below 30 and is not affected by road surface changes. Wheel and axle shaft bearing noise is typically a continuous growling or whirring sound which is unaffected by road surface changes. In some cases, you can vary the sound by lightly applying the brakes while you hold the car at a steady speed. To tell which side has the noisy bearing, you can usually increase the noise by sharply swerving the car to shift the body weight to the inside of the turn. This loads both the front and rear bearings on one side so you'll still need shop inspection to tell which bearing is the noisemaker. Transmission noises can be isolated by running the road test in different selector ranges. If changing the selector position causes the noise to come in at a different speed, the sound is probably in the transmission. Engine or exhaust noise can be isolated by first noting the speed where the sound is loudest. Then stop the car, shift to neutral, and again listen for the sound as you run the engine up to test speed. Now in the axle, it is possible to isolate a noisy pinion bearing by changing the load direction. To check the front bearing, you shift to reverse, apply moderate brake pressure, and drive the car backward. For the rear bearing, you reverse the test and drive the car forward. Differential bearing noise is also a continuous growling or grating sound similar to that caused by rough wheel bearings, and the rate is at wheel speed. This bearing noise is usually constant on coast and drive. In comparison, the distinguishing thing about gear noise is its intermittent nature. This sound may come in at a certain speed and then disappear as the speed increases or decreases. It may only sound off on drive when accelerating. Sometimes, it's heard only at constant speed, 
or when coasting in gear. Depending on its cause, gear noise may be described as a whistle, buzz, whine, rumble, or a low roar. The exact cause will have to be determined by getting into the axle and inspecting the parts. However, when you get a noise only on coast from any speed, check the pinion flange nut before you start to take the axle apart. If the nut is loose, the pinion can move in and out a small amount and cause noise. In this case, you retighten the nut following the procedure given in the service manual and then rerun the road test. And be extra careful if the axle has a collapsible pinion bearing spacer. Over tightening the flange nut collapses the spacer too far. Then if you back off the nut to get correct preload, the spacer remains compressed and the nut will probably loosen again. Good points, Tech. Now, if the diagnosis narrows down to gear noise, adjustment can be the answer. To check the gear adjustment, you remove the carrier assembly or the axle housing cover and clean off the lube so you can check the gear tooth contact pattern. Inspect the drive gear teeth for nicks and dents. In most cases, you can smooth out minor tooth surface irregularities with a small oil stone. If the teeth look okay, you're ready to make a gear tooth pattern test. A contact pattern test is the best way to tell whether gear adjustment is practical. It also tells you what to adjust because you can see if the drive gear and pinion are at the basic setting determined in the machine at the factory. Okay, Bill, here's your chance to get into the act. Make sure there's no smeary lube on the gear and pinion teeth and then put that brush to work. What'll it be? Red lead or white? Oh, well, they're both okay, but the white shows up best for me. I'll have all the drive gear teeth coated on both sides in just a minute. Take it easy with that brush, Bill. Just dip in the bristle ends and brush on an even coat. If the coating is too thick, a pattern will smear. As we saw in the factory demonstration, the contact pattern is light when there's no load on the gears. To get a distinct test pattern, we put a friction load on the drive gear by prying against the differential case rim or by partially applying the parking brakes if the axle is in the car with the drums on. With load applied, turn the pinion to rotate the drive gear one full turn in each direction. If you rotate the gear more than one turn each way, any pattern variations will average out and cover up indications of excessive runout. On any tooth contact test, if the pattern doesn't look right on the first try, brush over the gear teeth again and repeat the test before you go any farther. Try to apply the same load for each test because load variations can change the pattern and make it misleading. Thank you, Tech. Now, when pinion depth and backlash settings are correct, the most distinct part of the contact pattern should be near center on both the drive and coast sides of the gear teeth. You see, when the gear is under actual operating loads, the tooth contact area spreads out, especially toward the heel of the teeth which explains why the heavy part of the test pattern should be near center to begin with. If the gear noise sounds loudest on drive or coast during the road test, pay special attention to the tooth contact pattern on that side when you make the test. A good pattern on the drive side is the most important thing, but don't ignore the coast side. You see, even if the gears are quiet on drive and the pattern on that side is centered, but way off on the coast side, the gears can be noisy. The tooth contact pattern is not acceptable if it is off-center on both sides of the gear teeth. If the pattern location changes around the gear. Or if the pattern is at the toe or heel on both sides of the teeth. Okay, Matt, that does it for now. We're at the halfway point on the record, so if someone will turn it over, we'll get on with tooth contact patterns. Okay, what's next when the contact pattern is way off center on both sides of the teeth? If backlash is correct, the usual adjustment for correcting an off-center pattern is resetting the pinion depth of mesh. This, of course, requires a thicker or thinner spacer washer or shim stack and another backlash adjustment. For example, where tooth contact is high on the heel end of the drive side, 
and also high on the toe end of the coast side, a thicker spacer is needed to move the pinion in toward the center of the drive gear. Increasing spacer thickness will move the contact pattern on both the drive and coast sides toward the center of the drive gear teeth. At the same time, the pattern moves down toward the root of the teeth, but this movement is smaller. Now, in the opposite condition, where tooth contact is low on the toe end of the drive side and low on the heel of the coast side, the pinion must move out, away from the drive gear center. So a thinner spacer is needed. With a thinner spacer, the contact patterns again move inward from the heel and toe ends of the teeth. However, in this case, moving the pinion out moves the pattern up, away from the root of the gear teeth. Now let's see. A thick spacer moves the pinion in, thin moves it out. Well, that's simple. But what if the pattern location varies? When the heavy part of the pattern moves back and forth around the drive gear, it may indicate excessive run out of the pinion or the drive gear. If the pattern variation repeats itself approximately three times around the drive gear, it's related to the gear ratio and suggests the pinion as the cause. Two pattern variations on opposite sides point to the gear. Repositioning may help with the gear, but run out in the pinion head calls for a new gear set. Now for the third condition. A toe or heel contact pattern on both sides of the teeth may be caused by backlash far out of adjustment. In some rare cases, you may find this pattern even when the backlash is okay. The cause then can be gear distortion or misalignment in the carrier housing. Now if a backlash adjustment is needed, First, make sure the drive gear bolts are torqued to at least 40 foot-pounds. Then set up a dial indicator so you can move the gear to the point of least backlash as a starting place for the adjustment. Along with backlash, we also adjust the differential bearing preload. To begin, remove the differential bearing adjuster locks and retorque the bearing cap bolts to about 60 foot-pounds to allow adjuster movement. Back off the adjuster on the back side of the gear to remove any preload and then retighten it just enough to eliminate bearing end play. Next, turn both adjusters an equal amount in the same direction and maintain zero bearing preload as you move the drive gear toward the pinion. Continue adjusting until you get one thousandth of an inch minimum backlash with zero bearing preload. Now tighten the adjuster on the tooth side of the gear as you continue checking the backlash. Move the adjuster one hole at a time until the final backlash setting is within specs. This adjusts the backlash and at the same time puts in the correct bearing preload. If you turn the adjuster in too far, don't try to make a correction by simply backing off. The bearing cup will not follow the adjuster outward because the cup expands enough under preload to stay put. Thank you, Tech. Now, after backlash and preload are set, put back the adjuster locks and retorque the bearing caps to specs. Rotate the gears several times in both directions to stabilize the bearings and recheck at the point of least backlash, plus three other positions about 90 degrees apart. Minimum backlash must be within specs at all four checkpoints around the drive gear, and all indications should agree within three thousandths of an inch. If the backlash around the gear varies more than this, you may find the gear or the differential case out of alignment. Okay, Matt, that covers testing and adjustment on the original gears. How about telling us how to pick the spacer washer or shim pack to use with a new drive gear and pinion? Well, you can use either of two methods, depending on the condition of the rear pinion bearing. If you reuse the rear pinion bearing, you can start with the original depth spacer, provided the new pinion marking is the same as the old. Subtract the difference when the new marking is more plus than the old. Add the difference when the marking is more minus. Now for the second method. When a new rear bearing is installed, you can usually set the pinion depth more quickly by using the axle gauge setting tool. You see, normal thickness difference between used and new bearings can change the pinion depth enough to throw out the original spacer thickness as a starting point. 
With the appropriate gauge parts installed as described in the service manual, you measure the space between the gauge block and arbor to find the required spacer thickness. Depending on axle type, you check this space with a spacer washer, shim pack, or feeler blade. Before you get into adjustments, Bill should know that the setting tool is also used to seat the pinion bearing cups in the carrier. Just remember that the accuracy of pinion setting and bearing preload both depend on properly seated bearing cups. Good points, Tech. To make the job easy, you lube the parts and start the bearing cups straight in the bores. Then, with the tool and bearing parts aligned in the carrier, tighten the tool compression nut to seat the cups as you rotate the tool to protect the bearings. The next step in the adjustment sequence for current axles without the collapsible pinion bearing spacer calls for bearing preload adjustment before the pinion depth setting. For axles with the collapsible spacer, the pinion depth setting comes first. With the tool in place for the pinion depth measurement, you next install the correct gauge block on the tool head so you can select the correct spacer washer or shims. Make sure the side of the gauge block aligns with the bearing pedestal. After that, center the crossbore arbor in the differential bearing pedestals and loosely install the bearing caps. Slide pieces of 2,000 shim stock between the arbor and the bearing caps to assure good seating, and then torque the bolts to 10 foot-pounds. The correct pinion spacer washer or shim pack should fit between the gauge block and the crossbore arbor with a definite drag. In the nine and three quarter inch axle, you make this measurement with a feeler blade. The spacer washer or shim thickness you select will be correct only if the pinion end is marked with a zero. If the pinion has a plus mark, you'll have to use a spacer that's thinner by the amount marked after the plus sign. Where the pinion marking is minus, you'll need a thicker spacer. Before you run a contact pattern with new parts, Turn the pinion and gear several times to stabilize all the bearings. Since there's always a chance that further pinion adjustment may be needed, it's a good idea to leave out the oil seal until you're satisfied with a pattern. Along the same line, when checking the tooth pattern in an axle with a collapsible pinion bearing spacer, you can leave out the spacer sleeve and install a dummy front bearing cone and pinion flange. All the details are covered in your reference book for this session. Matt, how about a few service tips for a wrap-up? Well, it's important to use the recommended special tools any time you remove or install the pinion shaft flange. You see, hammering on the front or back can distort the flange enough to make the universal joint run out of true. Hammer blows can also damage the bearings, the spacer sleeve, or the teeth of the pinion and drive gear. Be sure to check the journal surface of the companion flange where it contacts the pinion shaft oil seal. If the surface is rough or grooved, it can ruin the oil seal. So install a new flange, even if the groove is smooth. Now, for a final tip. When reassembling the eight and three quarter inch axles, be sure to install a new inner oil seal and gaskets on both sides to guard against possible leaks. That's it, Tech. Thank you, Bill and Matt, for giving us an interesting and informative session on rear axle diagnosis and service. We've covered a lot of ground in these two sessions, and gear noise problems should now be a lot easier to solve. Be sure to review your reference books for this session. You'll find the material we covered in the film, plus some axle gauge tool layouts, which should make it easier to assemble the correct parts when you use the tool. Check your service manuals for additional information on axle noise diagnosis and step-by-step -step details on axle overhaul. So long, see you at the next meeting.